Today, I'm going to be talking about the history of a notoriously disliked topic, logarithms. Wow, what an intro. Hey, hey guys, do you want to come listen to me talk about something nobody likes to learn about? What, what was that? Oh, you, you're busy? Alright, maybe another time then. Oh, oh, you're busy then too? Well, well, I didn't really specify a time. Yeah, that's super awkward. And you've made this really, really awkward now. Anyway, jokes aside, as we discover and uncover what logarithms are and why they even exist, you might come away from this video having more of an appreciation of their worth throughout mathematical history, uh, and you might even like logarithms by the end of the video. Alright, actually, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. You know, baby steps. Hi guys, my name is Kieran. Welcome to my channel where I explore bits of maths and engineering that tickle me fancy. If you're new here and you enjoy this kind of content and you just can't fathom a future that does not have my face in it, then there's only just one solution, and that is to subscribe to the channel, so that then you don't miss out on any of my future uploads, no matter how irregular. Anyway, let's get into it. The history of logarithms involves three main characters, all residing around the late 16th and early 17th century. The characters in question are John Napier, Joost Burgi, and Henry Briggs. Picture yourself in the early 17th century. The streets were filthy, diseases were plentiful, and people were constantly piddly-eyed since beer was safer to drink than water. Sounds delightful. Astronomy was big amongst mathematicians at the time, especially since telescopes had recently hit the scene, and they're mapping out the cosmos, so they're literally working with astronomical numbers. And when it came to multiplying and dividing these numbers, or finding the roots of them, it could, it could take months of number crunching, and it was actually becoming an, a, an actual need of, for scientists and mathematicians to, to be able to do this faster. John Napier was a Scottish laird, and when he wasn't practicing alchemy, communicating with the dead, or predicting the imminent end of the world, he was doing mathematics. He was particularly interested in computational mathematics, and had already contributed to this area with his invention of Napier's bones, which aided with multiplication. Now, he knew of this method called prostapheresis that converted multiplication into addition using trigonometric identities, but it was still tedious and quite error-prone. He had thought of a far superior way of doing a similar thing. In 1614, Napier published a description of the wonderful canon of logarithms, written in Latin so that it may be as accessible as possible to the world. Turns out Napier was working on his logarithms for the best part of 20 years. These were going to be big, and he knew it. In the preface, he said, Since nothing is more tedious, fellow mathematicians, in the practice of mathematical arts, than the great delays suffered in the tedium of lengthy multiplications and divisions, the finding of ratios, and in the extraction of square and cube roots, and in which not only is there the time delay to be considered, but also the annoyance of the many slippery errors that can arise. I had therefore been turning over in my mind by what sure and expeditious art I might be able to improve upon these said difficulties. In the end, after much thought, finally I have found an amazing way of shortening the proceedings. Ending with, Thus, students of mathematics, accept and freely enjoy this work that has been produced by my benevolence. When a professor of geometry at Oxford, Henry Briggs, studied Napier's logarithms, he was beside himself with admiration for Napier. Like, he was a real fan, you know? You could just imagine him juggling out and getting all the Napier merch, you know, some posters and t-shirts. You know, that didn't happen. But he did arrange a meeting with Napier, and we'll get to what they talked about in that meeting in a second. 
First, let me introduce Joost Berge. Berge was a Swiss clockmaker and mathematician, and around the same sort of time, he had created and invented his own version of logarithms, and just kept himself to himself, and didn't publish anything until six years after Napier, in 1620, mainly because Johann Kepler was getting on at him to do so. Fundamentally, Napier's and Berge's principles behind their logarithms were the same, they just approached it slightly differently. Allow me to explain. Take the geometric series of the powers of 2, where each term is the previous term multiplied by 2, or in other words, each term is 2 to the power of its term's position, commonly referred to as the term number. Notice that these term numbers make up an arithmetic sequence. Now say you multiply 4 and 8 together, and we know that that's 32, but if you look at its term number of 5, that's the sum of 8 and 4's term number 3 and 2. This is, of course, because when multiplying two powers with the same base, in our case it's 2, you add the exponents. Though this may not seem groundbreaking, this actually forms the basis of logarithms. So, what are logarithms? Well, especially in this case, they're actually the term numbers. For example, the corresponding term number of 8, say, could be written as the base 2 logarithm of 8, which is asking what power must 2 be raised to to equal 8, which we know to be 3. And if we move along the sequence to far greater numbers like 67,108,864 and 17,179,869,000, one hundred eighty-four. Imagine trying to manually multiply these together. Yeah, I'm already thinking of ways to procrastinate. But if somebody had already worked out what their base 2 logarithm was, and we could then just add them together and see what that logarithm relates to in the sequence, well then, that would be brilliant. Now that's great and all, but I hear you asking, what if I wanted to multiply numbers that weren't powers of 2? I mean, you don't ask for much, do you? Well, luckily, this is what Napier and Berge tackled. The key was to use powers of a number very close to 1. Napier chose a number very slightly less than 1, and Berge chose a number very slightly greater than 1. This brought successive terms far closer together, and covered a, a large range of numbers to a great deal of accuracy. And if you were after a number that was between two terms, since they were so much closer together, you could linearly interpolate between them quite safely. So yes, they, they calculated tens of thousands of powers of their chosen numbers. An incredibly laborious and time-consuming task, but one that would save an unfathomable amount of hours for engineers, scientists, and mathematicians later on down the line. Now back to Napier and Briggs. In their meeting, Briggs suggested some adaptations to the logarithms, the most important of which, in my opinion, was to make the logarithm of 10 equal to 1, or in other words, make the logarithms base 10 logarithms. This was important because currently there was no end to the logarithmic table. It could have gone on forever, there didn't seem to be any repeated pattern. And so, by using base 10 logarithms, they had a scenario where, because they, we, we work in a decimal system, if you have the base 10 log of 456, well then that's the same as the base 10 log of 4.56 plus the base 10 log of 100. This then meant that they only needed to make the tables up to 10, and people would just add on whatever magnitudes of 10 they needed. Napier and Briggs both agreed on the adaptations, and within two years of their meeting, Napier had passed away, and Briggs took on the work and created new log tables of base 10. The base 10 log tables spread like wildfire around the world, and they became the common logarithm that we know today. 
Logarithms acted as a catalyst in the development of maths, engineering and science. Johann Kepler dedicated his next book publication to the late Napier and Pierre-Simon Laplace said logarithms, by shortening the labours, has doubled the life of an astronomer. Such high praise from brilliant mathematicians. Come the 20th century, with the invention of computers and digital calculators, logarithms and logarithm tables were rendered obsolete of their original purpose. Algorithms and computational power could do very large multiplications and even find logarithms with ease. However, that does not mean to say that the notion or requirement of logarithms has gone. Quite the contrary. Instead, logarithms has become far more than Napier, Berge and Briggs could have ever imagined. It has become its own function, which we now know to be the inverse of the exponential function. This means that they are regularly used to manipulate and understand functions involving exponentials. For instance, a logarithm function would be used to calculate how long it takes for your cup of coffee to cool to room temperature since heat dissipates exponentially. Even as humans, we perceive certain stimuli in a logarithmic fashion. This is known as Weber's law. For instance, you can clearly see a difference in the number of dots on the left-hand side here in comparison to the number of dots on the right-hand side, even though the change in the number of dots are the same. This suggests then that we perceive the change in the number of dots in proportion to the amount of dots that were already there. And there's even an argument that this carries over to the way in which we experience life itself, since it feels like the years are getting faster as we get older because we compare a year to the length of our life that we've lived already. But I guarantee you, and I promise you, the years are as long as they ever were even when you're older. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video. This was a tough one to write and research because there was a lot to discover. So I really hope I've done it justice. You know the drill. If you liked the video, then help us out by hitting that like button and subscribe to my channel because it encourages me to keep creating curious content like this for you and lets me know you appreciate the effort. You can catch me on socials at Kieran W.A. McAvoy Thank you again very much for watching. I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.